Well, hey guys, and uh, thank you so much for joining me on this call. And uh, just great to see your faces, and I'm sure for many, many in the church will be thrilled to see your faces as well. Um, familiar to so many, but um, I should introduce you uh, for those who don't know you. Um, so firstly, uh, just give us a wave, Donald. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Donald or Uncle Donald. Many, no, this is Donald Brownmark. Um, Donald has been an elder at CLM for about 15 years, and uh, he's also one of our pastors. And uh, married to Rose, uh, two beautiful grown-up children, part of the church family as well. And during lockdown has become a granddad. And uh, to Kenzo, you know how excited you are about that, Donald. So great to have you here. Um, also, we've got Olivet Ihama. Uh, most of you will know Oli. Um, Oli's been part of the church probably for about seven, seven or eight, nearly eight years. Um, yeah. And um, Olivet's uh, a lawyer. And uh, also as part of CLM, she's uh, on our board of directors. Uh, one of our trustees here plays a really key role there and also oversees some of our life groups, what we would call um, a cluster leader. Uh, Olivet, thank you for joining us. And uh, last but by no means least, we have the young man himself, uh, Gabriel Badabo. And uh, Gabriel is part of our full-time staff here at CLM. He wants to be a fireman, but at the moment he is a pastor to our young people and a youth, uh, which I think is really what God wants for him uh, instead. So um, a different kind of fire. And uh, Gabriel, yeah, so Gabriel's uh, helping to lead our youth on Fridays and part of the team here and getting married this summer to Precious. So uh, that is so exciting. So thank you. And uh, really, really great to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we're talking about racism. Obviously, we're all so aware how this has, has come front and center the last three or four weeks uh, since the killing of George Floyd in the US. And, and as a diverse community, we're trying to move through this. And we just thought this conversation might be helpful for some. We're aware there's so much out there. We're also really aware in a conversation like this uh, we're only going to scratch the surface, but um, but we pray that, that this might be helpful as we make a bit of a start. So I, I wonder, just as a start, if I could ask you all just to share a little bit about your background. Um, why don't we just do that in the order that I've just introduced you? So, so Donald first, then Olivet, then Gabriel. Um, re relating to my background, um, I am Sierra Leonean. I uh, come, uh, come from uh, a wonderful, glorious city called Freetown, um, in, uh, which is its, the capital of Sierra Leone, and a hometown uh, for generations of my family. Uh, over, um, and um, the name, actually, Freetown, that suggests it was um, a, a, a town, a home for many persons who, want, who were freed and wanted to return back to Africa. Um, and um, we have been, uh, our history is tied up with that, um, but um, our, we as a family have been, um, lived in Nigeria when we were younger for a few years and then in Sierra Leone and then I came to work in the UK and as you can imagine, um, being in Nigeria, traveling from different places in, in Nigeria, as my father worked with uh, various administrations, um, and we were uh, we moved from place to place, and uh, then coming back to Sierra Leone with uh, an accent that wasn't totally Sierra Leonean by that time, um, <laughs> that posed some challenges, and then coming to the UK, where in my thirties, and then finding out that. Um, well, this, this was a totally different culture from what I've been used to. And um, I remember, as we speak now, working, coming into work professionally um, at um, uh, one of the largest telecommunications companies um, in the UK at the time. And how um, it was a challenge for somebody to be brought in at uh, a relatively um, a manage, a senior managerial position. Um, um, and where in a department that was not used to seeing uh, people of my race. Um, it was a challenge, um, but God saw me through um, many instances uh, because having been brought up in a, in a multitude of locations and countries 
we were we had grown used to uh, making ourselves fit in wherever uh, possible. And um, there are many challenges. Yes, I remember traveling a number of times with uh, my colleagues and going abroad to give presentations. And that itself was uh, an issue <laughs> for some people as to going out to represent the company. But I had um, some um, di directors and managers who believed that um, um, I had the potential to do so. And, what, and they were proved right because I was invited back a number of times uh, by the host countries to um, give them presentations or, or to come and train their personnel. So I praise God, he's helped me through the challenges and he always continues to do so. Uh, I have learned not to be defined by what um, uh, people uh, say or believe I am, but more or less to find my identity in who Christ says I am. And that has seen me through. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to some of that later in the, the conversation. Um, Olivet, just um, yeah, headline for us a bit of your background. Oh, sure thanks. So um, I was born in Nigeria, um, born to a Nigerian father and a British and Jamaican mother. So I was in Nigeria until I was about six years old. And then we moved to London where um, the family was until my parents moved us to Lincolnshire the countryside when I was 14. And so that was really my first kind of, um, kind of encounter with being in a minority group, obviously, you know, um, being born in Nigeria, I'm surrounded by uh, black people all the time. And then London was a much diverse um, city and uh, cultures. So um, yeah, I was, I was introduced to different races there. And then it was when we moved to Lincolnshire in the countryside that um, I really kind of understood that my, uh, yeah, the minority position and um and after i was there for about four years before i uh, moved to university and um yeah thank you it's great just to just to capture a little bit of that um gabriel similar in some ways i suppose but do let you share your journey yeah yeah um yeah so myself i'm um born and bred in the uk um and born in london um, in Hackney and um, I moved to Essex um, when I was in secondary school, born to Nigerian parents, so um, born very much um, well informed about my culture and identify, identifying as a Nigerian. Um, a British Nigerian is probably how I would class myself, so yeah, that's a bit about my upbringing and background. Great. Um, we, could, we could dig a lot more in, into some of that. Um, Oliver, I wonder if I could come to you first, because you know, really aware that um, the understandable outrage from the killing of, of George Floyd has, and the subsequent focus, um, the issue of racism, whether that's systemic or personal, is is not new, and I think that's something that has been very clear in the last few weeks. But um, I think the focus has been particularly intense and I, and I know it's been tough for so many people at this time and, and caused them to think and reflect and how have you been impacted personally in the last three or four weeks? Yeah so as you can imagine it has been quite a, um, a tough couple of weeks just mentally trying to process all of this. For me I chose not to actually watch the, um, the full video of the George um, Floyd killing just because I think for me, it was, it was too much and I knew it would probably take me to a place that would be quite hard to recover from. Um, but I saw the, I guess, the, the main photo and that was kind of enough for me. And at first I really tried to kind of, um, really try to avoid getting part, um, being part of um, kind of the outrage and the discussion just because I knew it would take me to a place that I probably kept buried for, for a long time. Um, I mentioned that I'd, um, um, my parents moved us to the countryside when I was 14. So that was kind of my first real kind of encounter with um, probably racial ignorance is how I would put it. So, uh, you know, as, a, as a, um, a student that went to a predominantly white school, so it was about 700 kids and only seven um, black, um, black kids, um, of which I was one. Um, so just being in that position and just having a lot of... Um, kind of ignorant comments that were made 
um, just help, I was just reflecting on those kind of things which I'd suppressed. It was just kind of day after day, just ignorant comments that were coming to my mind again. And I, you know, I found myself getting quite angry and quite upset. You know, one particular example that came to my mind um, was just uh, one day when I was in class, um, in my English literature class, and um, a teacher made an ignorant comment. Um, we, were, we were reading poetry, we were studying poetry at the time, and we were looking at a, um, a Jamaican poet and this poem that he'd written. And the teacher was trying to explain that um, it was written in the kind of style of a rap. And um, she was like, you know, does anyone want to have a go at, you know, at, at trying to, to rap this? And no one said anything. And then she looked at me and she was like, Olivet, you look like you can rap. And I was just like, what? Like, it was such a shock. I was like, you know, in, in a school where we all wear the same uniform, you know, nothing really differentiates us apart from, I guess, our race, really. And to be called out for something like that, I don't think she really even thought about how um, quite offensive that could be. And I just remember the exact feeling coming again of how kind of on the spot I felt and just almost kind of on display that I was being, you know, um, yeah, like she was putting me on display for a purpose that just wasn't, wasn't suitable at all. So it, it brought all those memories back. And like I said, the ignorant comments that have been made, whether by adults or, or, or kids in the school. And I just found that it was bringing to the surface a lot of things which um, I probably buried. And I think the Lord was saying, it, it's time we addressed some of these things um, that you've brushed off and some of this pain that you've not acknowledged or not told anybody about um, because it's, 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 part of, it's part of your growing, it's part of your development. And I think it, it led me to, say, to realize that actually it's part of me getting to know God more intimately if I allowed him to touch this place of hurt in my life. So yeah, that was, um, that's kind of been the process. And if I'm being honest, I'm still processing, um, still processing it. Of course. And, you know, really respect for all of you. You know, this is, this is a journey we're in. Um, and it's a process that, that you're, that you're in and that we're in, um, which is why I'm so grateful you're part of this conversation. I think we're, I'll, I'll come back to some of that, all of that, because I think how we process in a godly way is really important. Let me just come to Gabriel and, if I can draw you in, Gabriel, and just ask the same question for you, how the last three or four weeks have been for you? Yeah, um, yeah I'd say definitely some, some, some clear similarities with all of it um, in terms of, I didn't touch on it much before, but um, I grew up in London and at the time I grew up, especially being quite young, I moved when I was 13 or 13, I can't remember off the top of my head. So um, I was quite sheltered. I wasn't as, as aware of, um, racism, to be quite honest, um, I grew up um, in an estate. I went to a school that was probably majority black, um, which is quite rare in some parts of the country. But where I grew up, Catholic school um, was a place where a lot of uh, Africans would, would, would send their children. So um, I was around a lot of um, black children and the white children were actually the minority. Um, and I had no ill will against any, any race, to be honest with you. Um, and then I was kind of you know, picked up and moved to Essex. Um, at the time I moved to the part of Essex, I moved to um, South and it, was, it wasn't as diverse as it's growing to be now. Um, and, you know, we, it would, we, it'd be hard for us to find another black family on our road or in, in, um, in locality to us. And um, in school, there was, there was a handful in, in each um, year um, and that grew over the years. So for me, I feel like this time in particular, took me back to some of my experiences in school where I started, first started to realize what racism was and what a lack of understanding of different cultures was. Um, and to, to, to share an example in particular that has been playing in my mind that I've been able to share with you, Pastor Martin, was uh, uh, when I was in secondary school and um, someone, in essence, um, took a big issue with, with uh, another girl that had liked me, um, liking someone of my race um, and, and almost an element of disgust. And for me at that time, I was in honesty a bit baffled because I, I couldn't really understand or process it. I was only in year seven, I think, maybe year eight. Um, so for me, it was, it was a bit confusing and it took me some, some weeks to really understand why they felt that way. And um, I think I, in my late years of secondary school, I grew up with some, some resentment, but I just kind of harbored it and got on with it. Um, and as I came to know the Lord, particularly in university, I, I felt like the Lord healed me of a lot of my pain 
um, and a lot of the things that I was carrying, um, which I'm so thankful for. But I think this time took me back to those experiences and, and made me think of those that would still be experiencing that, particularly in different parts of Essex that are still not as diverse. And I feel like for me, um, I've been able to, to overcome the pain um, of personally, but this time brought back a pain of like a, a common pain for those that would be experiencing um, just the hurt that this situation would cause. And I've decided to personally come off social media um, quite in quite a um, uh, start and stop way because of um, my, my work. I'm, I'm on there quite often, but I've personally had to withdraw because it's been too mentally draining for me. Um, and that's helped me a lot. So yeah, I'd say it's impacted me in terms of uh, bringing up some, some memories that I've chosen to forget. Um, and it's probably helped me to turn to the Lord a lot more because I've had to turn away from things that I might normally um, be, be engaged with. I've heard, um, I've heard so many people in their own way um, similarly say, you know, the last three or four weeks, it, it's caused them to reflect on things that in just in trying to get on with life and trying to be a positive person. I've just kind of, you know, moved on. And or, or even I've heard people say, you know, kind of we, we laughed about it, only actually it wasn't funny. And and I think it, it has been for so many a time of revisiting some things that, that actually were wrong and, and hurt. And I think one of the things that's really impressed me talking to you is is while while the, the anger is there and the desire is there to see change and I think somehow we've got to hold on to that is your desire to process this moment in a godly way. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's just really important for us to take a moment on. Um, Donald, I'll come back to you in a moment, but Olivet, can I maybe just come back to you and, and then Gabriel? Of, and I know, like you've said, Olivet, this is a process that is, you know, it, it's still in play, but, but I'm, how have you tried to, um, walk through these last three weeks and, and, and process it in a way that is honourable to the Lord? Yeah, for me, I, I would say the most important thing I've done is bring my pain to God. Um, like, he can't heal what I won't allow him to touch. So I've, I've tried to acknowledge that that pain is there, it's a real thing, and not bat it off. Um, Acknowledge those emotions that I feel and saying, Lord, I give this to you. I don't want to carry this around with me. Um, Take it. And, you know, just from my walk with God so far, I've seen him do beautiful things through pain and just knowing that in past pain that I've experienced, there's always been a purpose when I've given it to God. It's never just been a wasted emotion. So in giving it to him, I'm beginning to see there's a purpose and I, and that's part of this process is that he's, he's revealing what this, um, what the purpose of this is to me. And so what I think the enemy meant to just have me down in a bad place, actually God is shining light on, which has given me hope. Um, so that's been one of the things I've, um, that's been really important for me in this process is giving it to God and being quite careful of who I, I kind of bear my, my, my kind of pain and hurt to. Um, And the second thing I've done very much like Gabriel is I've been very selective about the things I feed on in terms of what I watch, what I read, because there's so many voices out there right now. And, you know, some good, some bad. So just in terms of videos where it just shows police brutality, I just, as addictive as it might be to keep watching video after video, I just know that that stuff isn't going to help me. It's just going to get me to to be even more angry and it's going to, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to help me get in a good place with God. So I've decided, okay, I, I, can't, I can't feed on those. Um, I need to feed on things that will edify my spirit. Um, and even just sometimes just cutting out the noise, you know, even sometimes, you know, just feeding on good things and good things and good things. It's just too much information. And, you know, in a world we live in today, it can be very loud. So just having moments of silence where it's, I'm not reading anything, whether good or bad, or watching anything, whether good or bad, I'm just allowing God to speak. And that has been, again, so healing for me. I've just been taking the time to just go out walking and just have, um, there's an app that I listen to um, that I have called Dwell, and it's just the Bible just being read. And to be honest, that's just been so healing for me just to be hearing the word of God, um, and so those two things particularly have been um, 
have been really important and um, has helped me in this process. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gabriel, what about you? Mm, yeah, um, quite similar to be honest with you, but I said two, ma two major things I've tried to be intentional to do in this time. Firstly, is to just assess my own heart and assess where it's at um, and how I feel toward what's going on. Um, I think there's, so, there's, there's certain conversations you might, might not be able to have in public or on social media, but my own self, I, was, I thought I'd be, be intentional to draw away and, and ask myself and bring before the Lord and assess, do I hold any ill feelings towards people of other races? Um, are there some misconceptions or generalizations that I have about other races that I need to deal with? If my desire is to love all people, um, and I'm one that's, I, has a, I have a heart to see all nations discipled. And if I truly do have a heart for that, I need to love them. I need to love them equally. And um, I had to ask myself, are there some things that I need to be teared down in my own heart that are stopping me from loving people well? Because um, I know the journey I've gone on, and I know that people of other races, I didn't always treat them the same way. And I might feel like because I've come to know the Lord that everything's all fine, but I truly don't believe that to be the truth. The Lord's always working on us. And I had to draw away and, and ask the Lord to, to point out places in my, in my heart that are cold towards other people. Um, and also had to assess if there's still pain I'm carrying towards those that I feel like have hurt me. Because I feel like for, for, for black people, when you experience pain from maybe a, um, a certain person that's of another race, if it's a white person, sometimes you can paint all white people with the same brush. Um, and that might be unconscious. And I had to ask myself, do I feel a certain type of way about white people because of what I feel ha has happened to me? Um, so I've really been assessing that and that's been so healthy for me. And, and I've seen areas where, you know, there's this ugly parts of my heart and the Lord's been dealing with that and I'm appreciative of that. And I've taken, you know, my heart would be that it, 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 it wouldn't have taken this to, to bring that um, about. But I know the Lord, um, as Olivet alluded to, um, can use the times where the enemy meant for evil and, and bring so much good from it. And he's, and he's um, doing great things in my heart. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I say another thing that I've been has really struck me, in fact, from a couple of weeks back, Pastor Esther mentioned um, the importance of, I'm going to paraphrase here, but she spoke about, you know, what we watch. Um, are we spending that much time in prayer? Are we spending my, that much time with the Lord? And that, that impacted me a lot because um, I was already in a place where I was like, I need to draw away from social media. But I asked myself, you know, the one who knows what's going on, who knew this time was coming, how much time am I spending in his presence asking him for help? asking him for direction. Mm -hmm. So I've been, um, it's been impressed upon me to, 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 to spend more time with the Lord and, and just perceive what, what you want to do through me and what are you trying to do through the world and through your bride, the church at this time. So the two things I'd say in particular. I've done. Um, just want to say um, how proud I am of you guys. I mean, you know, I'm not just, I know exactly what you're going to say, but that's so humbling and, um, yeah, thank you. It's really inspiring. Um, I think this is such a challenge because it's such a massive issue and we don't want to let the moment pass. And I'll maybe comment on that, but yeah, how we walk this out in a godly way, I think is, is so key. Um, Donald, I've kind of come past you a little bit there. Do you want to add anything in, um, over the last three or four weeks? I know it's been a bit different for you. Yes, I, it has been. I mean, there have been times when um, I've caught myself reflecting on the past. And as I mentioned, at, uh, when I was at work, um, but um, it, to, some, to a larger extent, it's been less about me because in my pastoral capacity, I've had to have, um, I've had several conversations. And I must confess from all sides, those um, who feel uh, the, the pain of uh, at this moment and the, uh, uh, often reflect on the uh, racial slurs uh, that were cast against them and acts of violence and lost opportunities, the fear of uh, the police, the service. You, you can imagine lots of issues coming together and many who have felt uh, victimized and still have fears um, uh, of the authorities and of even as to whether they could progress in their profession. So all these things have come together, but yet still on the other side, I've spoken to others um, from um, other uh, cultural backgrounds as well, who, as well, who feel discriminated against 
and this issue has come to life for them. And um, on the, um, the, the, the side, because our church is what it is, a wonderful multicultural church, I have had from others who are, who are not, um, who, do not uh, who are white and who identify with non-black uh, uh, um, uh, racial cultures and who feel sometimes a sense of being unaware that this thing was so deep until they hear the stories and, uh, and um, are shocked sometimes, but it's a challenge for us all, I, I, I have found. It's a challenge for us all. Um, as um, uh, Christians, we should remember that we are one body in Christ. We are in this, we're all in this together. When one part of the body um, suffers, the whole body suffers with it. And uh, so we must hear from each other. And that's what I've tried to do quite often is listen, uh, engage, acknowledge the pain somebody is going through. On the other side, acknowledge that they genuinely, people are genuine on both sides and just being aware of that and then being aware of some of our responsibilities to speak on behalf of the voiceless and to uh, champion those um, who've been treated unjustly. Uh, some of these issues have just come to the fore. And I think it's, it's time that we um, engage ourselves, uh, not only in dealing with our pain, but in recognizing that others are going through challenges um, as well. It's great, so helpful. I mean, uh, the purpose of this conversation is, isn't really for, for me to take time and, and highlight you know, where we are as a leadership, but it's worth me throwing in, in, in that, that I think this is, this is a, a different moment and, and an opportunity that we really don't want to pass us by. And we have some great conversations at leadership level of how we can um, properly look into the issue of racism and look to play our part, uh, both inside the body of Christ here and then in society and help one another and stand together and strengthen unity. And you know, we'll have some more things to say, I think in, in the next few weeks to bring clarity on that. Um, one thing um, as we come towards uh, an, an end of this conversation for now is, um, is how, because I, I think we are in a moment. I mean, I've, I have never experienced a sense of, of appetite and acknowledgement um, a clarity of expression I think across all backgrounds and I think there is a different desire that I'm perceiving and I pray that says we want to change this this is this is not right not for the next generation and, and not just taking a stance against personal racism but really dealing with systemic racism and um, you know I, I really hope that is the case um, but but of course the reality is that that if we get there, that is going to be a journey as a society, and it's going to take time and prayer. It's going to take strategic action, and I think we we all have a responsibility. I think this is relevant to everybody right now. Um, so we have a responsibility to say what I can do. But here's the thing: is um, while while it takes time for systemic racism to change, and and we pray that in a generation it it has completely changed. It's not going to change overnight. So. So how, how do you live with the reality of what is in society and yet, and yet not be defined by it? And Donald, you, you said a little bit, I think right at the start about this is how you've tried to walk your life. And I think for me, particularly as church, where we don't miss a moment and say, we've got to deal with this. But at the same time, we're saying, we're, but we're not going to be defined by this. We're going to define by the word. And so I'd, I'd love you all just to share, because I know you've got things to say into this, but um, Donald, you, you brought it up first. So why don't you go first? How have you tried? You've tried to walk this out for, for years, decades. <laughs> decades. <laughs> I, I just, as you say that, I just uh, recall uh, having conversations with my son when he was going to school, when he was going to college, when he was going out um, to, uh, into the streets and with his friends. And I must confess, it, it has been a challenge. Um, it was a challenge still, is to some extent, where you're saying, don't do this, don't do that, be careful here, be careful. Unlike what other parents might think, I was quite concerned about the institutions out there that were not performing, uh, people out there that harbored 
um, um, hate or um, uh, different uh, attitudes to people. And my concern and pressure was always, don't do this, don't do that. Sometimes be sitting up all night long waiting for him to come back safe. <laughs> you know, it was as bad as that. And um, for me, this should not, if, all, if at all possible, continue into yet another generation. And, and I'm at that point in time now where there's another generation coming. And I'm saying, I hope my son doesn't have the same conversations with his own um, son. But we are Christians at the end of the day. I mean, one of the things I enjoy about our church is uh, our core values. Are, uh, one of our core values is to bring the kingdom of God in, into every life and every sphere of society. Uh, and as Christians, um, therefore, I believe we should be standing up and not turning bl our uh, blind, our eyes blind from discrimination or injustice where we see that um, uh, because it does not affect us. So this is a time I think it's, it's a call to the whole body of Christ, not just our church, the body of Christ, Christians everywhere. This is why we've been called the church. Uh, this is, is who we've been called to be, um, just as the church, uh, um, our church and other churches as well, have stood um, um, together against um, human trafficking, and um, which many are aware of happens in the UK. Uh, but we teamed up with partners uh, such, a, such as Hope for Justice uh, um, uh, to act as one voice um, with the aim of um, driving uh, policy changes, taking legal action, and showing compassion, uh, compassionate support to victims. Uh, for me, I believe um, we, we should similarly be united against um, um, the injustice um, um, of, um, um, of racism, of discrimination in general. Um, we should be um, looking at um, these issues wherever God has placed us, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our colleges uh, and uh, institutions around the country, in all spheres of society, um, it, even when it is inconvenient to do so. Uh, I think it's, it's a time for a higher calling. It's a time uh, for a deeper sense of understanding what the Spirit of God is saying to us as Christians. Uh, and we should be the change agents um, in our society. And I dare say, even in politics and in government, where we are able to influence local and national policies, this is who we're called to be light and salt in our world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And thank you. Um, Olivet, for you, maybe at a, at a personal level, and I, I think this is something I'd just love to hear about is, you know, living at times regrettably in, in the reality of where we are now, um, but not being defined by that. Um, how, yeah, what, what would you be able to say into that? So I think the great thing about processing this with God is that he's just spoken such, such peace um, and, and great revelation into my heart that just makes me really hopeful in this time. One of the great things that have come out of this is that my identity in Christ is so much more solid now than it was ever before. Um, just realizing that when God made me, he intentionally made me to be a black woman. He wanted me to navigate this life as a black woman, not as a black man or a white man or a white woman. So there's purpose in my, in my blackness really. Um, and just realizing that the power of my God is greater than the limitations of racism. And if God wants me in a place, he will get me there. It doesn't matter who is plotting against me. And, you know, just being able to look at scripture and just seeing like, you know, with Joseph, the amount of people that plotted against him, but just knowing ultimately that God had the palace destined for him. And that's where he got him to, you know, without really the help of anybody. So just really knowing that my identity is in Christ and that the door he has opened for me, no man can shut. And I think that's just something I think the enemy really wants to, um, to make our generation um, really doubt who they are. There's so many things nowadays trying to tell you who you are and, and mold you and, and, and build you up into something that you're not. Whereas God has said in his word, who I am. And that is what I've chosen to, um, to believe and just kept on going back to that. And he's reminded me, you know, 
um, not only that am I a child of God, that as part of the church, I am the bride of Christ and receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior means the Holy Spirit lives within me. So I am the temple um, in which he dwells. So I've got, I've got God to the power of three uh, <laughs> with me. And, you know, and looking at it from that point of view, I just, not that I am, um, I'm blase to the, to the effect that man can have, but I get my instruction from God. I, I take my plans before him. That's why I think it's so important as the word says that we're not to lean on our own understanding and we're to, to bring our plans before the Lord. Because once he has spoken something over me, I have every belief and trust that he will carry it out and it doesn't matter who is standing against me. So I really believe that in this time that um, as, as the body of Christ, we need to make sure our identity is rooted in Christ, not in our achievements, not in our race, not in our gender, because all those things will fail us when we get to a door that, you know, should open to me because of my achievements, should open to me because of my race and it's closed. We're going to find, you know, identity crisis. But when our identity is in Christ, that's a foundation that cannot be shaken. And just again, realizing that the platforms he gives us is never to build our kingdom. It's always to build his. So rem remembering that if he has spoken something over me, he will get me there. And when he gets me there, it's to build his kingdom. Again, just looking at um, in the Bible and seeing Moses and seeing that, you know, the plan was to kill all these baby boys, but somehow, you know, uh, an Israelite baby boy ended up being in the palace and Pharaoh basically feeding him. And, you know, when Moses got to that age where he was able to see injustice, he could have just said, you know what, I'm good. Let me just kind of, let me just kind of look after myself here. But he saw that and he was willing to lay down that privilege um, for something of a, of a greater calling and a higher calling. Um, so for me, it's just realizing that I am who God wants me to be. And he has a purpose for every characteristic and every feature he's given me. And it's all for his glory. So um, I think I'm only going to be able to really realize the fullness of that by, um, by leaning and pressing into him more. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, <laughs> thanks for preaching. Um, great, great, Oliver. Great. Um, Gabriel. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's hard to follow Oliver after that, but um, I think... Um, for me, um, one thing I can very simply share um, is just um, that it's so important for us as children of, the, as children of God at this time to allow ourselves to be an example to society around us. And um, there can be misconceptions and, and um, lies and, and all sorts of false mis misrepresentations that have been, have been fed down from generation to generation. And um, that can be broken in an instant, not by a man, but by God. And he can use us as a vessel um, to do that. And I've been so encouraged in my life to, to speak to people and, and, and hear them say, as sad as it is, hear them say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know black people were like that. I didn't know there were some of you that were okay. And although that can cause someone a lot of pain, for me, I take victory in that because the Lord has used me to tear down a lie um, that the enemy has tried to plant in someone's heart and mind. And I believe that the Lord wants to use each and every one of us um, to do that. And my encouragement to you, um, especially from speaking as a young black man, um, to, to young black men out there, my encouragement to you is to be an example, to not walk in the way that society will try and um, burden you with or, or box you in, but to say, I'm going to be an example of something different. Um, my identity is in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to show people the love of Christ, and that's going to break down every lie they may have about me. And I also want to encourage um, um, white Christians at this time to, to stand up and and be the, be the difference in a place where people might have lies about maybe black people or how they conduct themselves to say, no, I, I have a black brother, I have a black sister, and they're not that way. I know them. Um, okay. And um, it's a chance for us to, to come and tell on every single lie and allow the Lord to work through us. So mm -hmm. that's what I'd say. And um, I'd also just very quickly add um, that for me in this time, I've had to, to, to accept that the only person that can change the heart of a man, that, or a man or a woman that is racist or has... Um, racial thoughts um, or racial um, um, ignorance at this time is, is by healing their heart, by changing it from the core of their heart. So if that's the case, then it's going to be through his love that that's going to come. It's going to be a transformation of the heart. And he wants to use us as his agents of change um, to, to share his love and to break down those lies. So my, my, my encouragement um, to, to everyone is to, to be prayerful about that, prayerful about God to come and change people's hearts from the inside out. 
um, not just their minds and the way they think, but the state of their hearts. So great. So great. Thank you. And just before we finish in prayer, um, Donald, let me ask you, um, what, what, what are you praying is the result of this season that we're in right now, this, this moment, if I can call it a moment? Yeah. I think um, one would say that the first and foremost for me is um, that um, there is a renewal of men's um, 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 minds and hearts. Um, I think we have a wonderful opportunity with this um, lockdown situation where we cannot just get away from things. We have opportunities to sit down, to reflect. And um, for the Christian uh, uh, and, and, and uh, who, who, who are followers of Christ is to hear from him, um, to lean on him, um, to trust his word uh, and to be found in him. Uh, and um, it says uh, we, we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And it's a transformation process. It's not, we're not all fully transformed yet. So let's be gracious to each other. Let's um, give a room for um, people who may not fully understand um, um, the, the work the, and the journey on which uh, we individually are, are going through. Uh, but let's be gracious to ourselves as well when we make mistakes uh, or, or misunderstand others. Uh, I feel there is a sense in which we need to uh, carry everything to the Lord in prayer, uh, put our trust uh, and our hope in him, seek him for the direction forward, hear him say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And in that manner, bring ourselves wholly before him and trust that his yoke is easy. In this time, his burden is light and we can all carry his burden not the burden of the pains we have been going through. Amen. Oh, Thank you. Um, as I said at the start, we're going to scratch the surface, um, but I want to say such a huge thank you to all of you. Um, I love you and I'm so impressed with you. And thank you privately as well as here for being willing to share with me some of your stories and journey. And um, thank you for the inspiration that, that you are. I'm part of this conversation. Um, we do need to keep praying, Donald, and just journeying together, talking together, and as a community, um, uh, drawing towards this conversation, not away from it. Um, as we finish this, uh, this conversation here today, um, Gabriel, would you, would you close in prayer for us? Yes, of course. I'd love to. Um, I, want, you know, I want to just add something very quickly that's quite heavy on my heart. Um, and uh, I feel like it'd be important for me to share, but I want to just uh, very, very quickly say that for me, in this time of suffering, um, one thing that's been so important for me is to look to the one who suffered most, um, our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's not a better example you can look at as one who suffered unjustly. Um, and I want to encourage everyone that, that, is, that is in pain right now, that's carrying anger um, to an injustice system, that our Savior faced the same. And dare I say, in, in a much more gross manner. And um, I want to encourage us to take inspiration from him and to look to his life and to look to how he dealt with it. And we touched on it a bit, but one of the greatest ways I see Jesus dealing with his pain is going to his father and speaking to him. And I just want to encourage us to, to, to look to his example and find comfort in that and comfort in his word. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Thank you. It's great. Yeah. Um, Heavenly Father, we just... Uh, Come before you today in thanks and adoration. We thank you that you indeed are the everlasting Lord, the one who has been since the beginning of time and will be at the end of time. And we, we look to you now at this time and we ask you, Lord, to, to rest your hand upon our world, Lord. We know this is a, a world issue right now. And we ask, Lord, that you would, you would come and have your way, Father God. We thank you that you are the creator of mankind, Lord, every nation, every tribe. And you love us all individually and collectively and we ask father god that you would come and have your way we thank you there's purpose in the pain that many will be experiencing at this time and we ask lord god that you would have your way lord we pray so often that your kingdom would come we pray it once again that your kingdom would come at this time that your will will be done we pray lord against um any lies that would want to take root in our heart that would want us to carry bitterness and envy and anger and lord we pray that you would overwhelm us with your love you would come now and allow us as your church to rise up to be an example and 
instruments of change. We pray you unite us together, Lord, not just for the church of CLM, of in Coventry, in our nation, but in the world, that we would be an example and we would show the world um, what your love can do, what it's done to us and what you desire to do to the world. So, Lord, we thank you. We give you all praise and glory. And we ask that you come and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And I will see you soon.